A nucleophile is defined as an electron pair donor. This means it will have an atom with a lone pair of electrons on it that can be donated to an atom with a partial positive or full positive charge in order to form a covalent bond between the two. Nucleophiles can substitute onto a halogenoalkane via a mechanism called nucleophilic substitution. There are two types of nucleophilic substitution, SN1 and SN2, where the S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and the number indicates how many reactants are involved in the rate determining step. In this video, we'll go through the differences between the SN1 and SN2 mechanisms, we'll discuss why one mechanism would be favoured over the other, and we'll finish with a comparison of their stereochemistry. In an SN1 reaction, the rate determining step only involves one reactant, the halogenoalkane. The carbon halogen bond is polar because the halogen is more electronegative than the carbon atom. So the bonding pair of electrons sits further towards the halogen end of the bond. What initiates the SN1 reaction is these electrons spontaneously shifting all the way onto the halogen, causing the bond to break and leaving a carbocation and a halide ion. This is a slow process. But as soon as it happens, the nucleophile will be electrostatically attracted to the carbocation and will move in to form a new bond with the carbon atom. In an SN2 reaction, the rate determining step involves two reactants, the halogenoalkane and the nucleophile. The nucleophile will be attracted towards the delta plus carbon and will form a bond with it. This simultaneously repels the electrons in the carbon-halogen bond all the way onto the halogen to kick out a halide ion and leave behind the new molecule. So, an SN1 reaction always occurs in two steps and an SN2 reaction always occurs in one step. So why would SN1 occur in some cases while SN2 occurs in other cases? Let's start with SN1. The biggest barrier for this mechanism is the formation of the carbocation. So SN1 will be more likely if a more stable carbocation can form. I covered this in my electrophilic addition video, but I'll quickly recap it here as well. Alkyl groups are electron donating, meaning they'll push electrons towards the positively charged carbon atom. The more alkyl groups there are, the more electrons are being pushed, and therefore the more the positive charge is stabilised. So, primary carbocations are the least stable, followed by secondary carbocations, and then tertiary carbocations are the most stable. This means that a tertiary halogenoalkane is more likely to undergo SN1 in comparison to a primary halogenoalkane due to the relative stability of the carbocation intermediates that will form. As for SN2, the biggest barrier for this mechanism is whether or not a nucleophile will be able to find its way to the delta plus carbon atom to form a covalent bond. Let's compare a primary and a tertiary halogenoalkane. The delta plus carbon on the primary halogenoalkane is bonded to two small hydrogen atoms and only a single bulky alkyl group. This means the delta plus carbon is more exposed, so it's easier for a nucleophile to attack it. In the tertiary halogenoalkane, the delta plus carbon atom is bonded to three bulky alkyl groups. These alkyl groups take up a lot of space and get in the way of incoming nucleophiles, preventing them from reaching the delta plus carbon. This phenomenon, whereby bulky groups reduce the likelihood of a reaction, is called steric hindrance. So, to summarise this, primary halogenoalkanes don't tend to undergo SN1 because they would form unstable carbocations and instead tend to undergo SN2 because of low steric hindrance. Tertiary halogenoalkanes tend to undergo SN1 
because they form more stable carbocations and don't tend to undergo SN2 because of high steric hindrance. Secondary halogenoalkanes, being halfway between primary and tertiary, can undergo either SN1 or SN2. Now that we've seen an overview of each mechanism, let's take a deeper look at the stereochemistry for each of them. To prevent this video from getting too long, I'll go over the fundamentals of stereochemistry and isomerism in another video. For an SN1 reaction, let's start with an optically active halogenoalkane, or in other words, a halogenoalkane that exhibits optical isomerism. The delta plus carbon originally has a tetrahedral configuration. After the halogen leaves, the carbocation intermediate will have a trigonal planar configuration. This molecule is flat and is equally likely to be attacked by a nucleophile from above or from below. Therefore, 50% of the products will be one optical isomer and 50% of the products will be the other. This results in a racemic mixture, which is a mixture that contains each optical isomer in a 50-50 ratio, so that, overall, the mixture is not optically active, as both isomers effectively cancel each other out. How about SN2? Let's take a look at the 3D structures during an SN2 reaction. The nucleophile always attacks the halogenoalkane from the opposite side to where the halogen is, because this direction has the easiest access to the delta plus carbon. This results in a transition state like this. By the way, a transition state is not the same as an intermediate. A transition state is very short-lived and can't be isolated, as it's essentially halfway between two stable molecules. An intermediate is much more stable and can be isolated and detected. A carbocation is an example of an intermediate. A reaction doesn't always have an intermediate. SN2 doesn't, for example. But there is always a transition state. A transition state is essentially the configuration of the atoms as they are transitioning from the reactants to the products. In this transition state, we can see that the bond to the nucleophile is partly formed and the bond to the halogen is partly broken. As the nucleophile continues to move in, the halide ion continues to move away and we're left with this product. Notice that the bonds around the carbon centre are inverted during the reaction. So, an SN1 reaction tends to cause racemization whereby an optically active reactant is converted into a racemic mixture of products, which are not optically active overall because they cancel each other out. An SN2 reaction causes inversion, for example, where if the reactant was optically active and it rotated plane polarized light in a clockwise direction, the product would rotate plane polarized light in an anti-clockwise direction and vice versa. Both SN1 and SN2 are still nucleophilic substitutions, but as we've seen, they have a lot of differences. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to support the channel and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.